video. Let's just yep. push them all the way. Yep. Ah, buongiorno, come stai? We are back, and uh, it's uh, we are recording. I have avoided legal snags just now by telling Pierre that he is once again being recorded. Thank Pierre, you. you are being recorded. Thank you very much. We have many things to discuss. Many things to discuss. <laughs> so, one thing that came to mind that uh, you you sent me a couple of things and one of the things you asked me was how do you determine the quality of a biography uh -huh. i think was the first question that you you asked so how do you identify yeah. a good a good biography well yeah. without reading it first obviously without reading it first Without reading it first, oh, that was that was that was conveniently left out in that question. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I think, I think, I think. To me, what I would what I would want to know is who wrote it. What's the background of the person who wrote it, um, and different different viewpoints of different people i think can can be very interesting as long as you are aware of those viewpoints so for example if you are reading i'm making this up as i go but if you are reading a, or about to read a biography of say a democratic pay, uh, a president uh, and it is written by a, a republican uh, uh, biographer then you know that 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 is likely to influence that person's uh, opinion of of the person the author's opinion will be influenced by that author's in this case political viewpoint which could be a good thing or i think could be a bad thing depending on how you look at that that means that if that person for example, the president was a Democrat and the author was a Republican, then you can expect, I think, some critical uh, approximations of that president's life and work. But that no, may actually... Sorry? Oh, I was going to say not to be too, too much of an extremist here, but if it were a Republican president written of being written about by a Democratic writer... Yeah. Would the bias be as extreme? Well, yeah, exactly. So that I think I think is something to 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 think about. And even oh, if there yeah. is even if there is a bias, um, is it a bad thing? Because that probably just means that someone will be very critical of how what that person has done. Of course, I'm not just talking about presidents. You could be all kinds of uh, people, artists, scientists, uh, uh, whatever you're interested in in, in reading. But I think that to me would be interesting that it because if you do read, say, a democratic present by a democratic author, then would would that be fair? Would that not be more of a, a positive a geography? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that, I think, is, is not necessarily better either. So for me, that I think would be a big question. Like, what is this person's background in relationship to the person they're writing about? OK. Uh I, I was asking because uh, I have a number of composers that I really like, and naturally you want to know more about their lives, and trying to find a good biography, I mean, to me, I guess the question is, what does it mean for it to be a good biography? For it to be um, factually correct is, for the people that I'm interested in, that is the most important thing to me. Right. Um, the question of bias you know, I you know, I don't I don't worry too much about bias because a fact can't be biased. Either it happened or it yeah. didn't happen. Yeah. So, like, I'm thinking, like, I'll tell you, I really enjoyed reading the biography that I read of J of, of John Brahms, Johannes Brahms. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember I don't remember the author's name, but I like that it was kind of like. This is his life story as best as I've been able to figure out how to retell it. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. I would say that was a good biography. It was, you know, a little dry at times. 
and he didn't spend a lot of time peppering it up to make it a more interesting read, which I appreciate. But um, a book that I enjoyed immensely, but which I would call not really a good biography, is a book called Rachmaninoff's Recollections as told to Oscar von Reisman. Uh, it's a <clears throat> little kind of a bedside reader that really kind of functions as a, here's this genius, what drives you, Mr. Genius, in the morning? What, you know, how do you, you know, and it's, it's just kind of like Rachmaninoff propaganda a little bit. Yeah. But it's immensely satisfying and it's fun to read because you already know you like Rachmaninoff. And of course you want to read some stuff about, you know, read something positive about him. But it doesn't fill me in with the details because, you know, as far as we know, that I know, the details of his life are like, here's a story, here's a story, here's a story. We all know those, the five stories of Rachmaninoff's life. Well, what about the gaps? That's kind of missing in a world of yeah. facts. And how do you know that your book is going to tell you that your biography is going to tell you what's in it before you start reading it? That is, I struggle with that. I don't have a good answer. Um, I just know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, my, my favorite biography that I've heard of that was in terms of its quality is say the, the, the biography of J.S. Bach by uh, Albert Schweitzer. It's, um, it is very subjective, written by a guy who puts this guy up on a pedestal. Right. But it's also filled with, you know, background stories and some factual things that are nice, but it's always being so editorialized yeah. that he doesn't want to let you have too much space to make up your own mind. And I strongly dislike that. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a question that we might not have an answer for our viewership, um, our viewership, the three people who, you know, I don't know, but I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. And I was hoping that you might have because I'm sure you read more than me. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, um, uh, I, I did. I did enjoy what you said about making up your mind. You never struck me as someone who has a strong opinion on things, Pierre. Are, are you sure that that's something that figures largely? Uh, but but no. But uh, yeah, no, I, I understand what you mean, and I, I think it's interesting. So uh, let me give you one example, which I find fascinating. So most uh, most psychology programs have a course in it called the history of psychology which is I always find interesting. And I remember when I was studying, we had to take this course in our second year and it was taught by a great instructor, a great professor who could really tell the story of all these big figures in a very interesting manner. But what I found really extraordinary was the textbook we used, which at that point had the size of, I would say a good, like a, a pocket, just like a, like a trade paperback pocket that you would read. And it was called The Pioneers of Psychology by Raymond Fancher. And the interesting thing about that book was that it started, I want to say at that point, it, it that was a couple of editions ago, it didn't really start with ancient Greek philosophy, but I think he may have touched upon that. But the interesting thing about that book was that it was a textbook. It was an actual textbook, but it read like a novel. It's the only time I've ever read something like that where he had... A fantastic mix of this is Rene Descartes. He was born in uh, 1596 and here and there, and then he became a soldier there and he did this and this and this. And by the way, for psychology, this is what he meant. But the way he told these, it was like a, a narrative, a story of, of these people's lives interspersed with, oh, and you know, there was important theory, namely this and this and that. But by the way, he also always convinced his teachers that he was allowed to study in bed because that was where he did his best work. So he had exactly for me the right mix of kind of fun, interesting anecdotes that really made people come alive and also factual, like the actual factual knowledge, which was really interesting. Wow, is this guy a time traveler? Because I can imagine a textbook like that would take a hundred years to write. Yeah, it, it was it was insane. Amazing. It was insane. And and again, because it's 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 the even this professor said, I will give you every question I can ask on the test before you do the test, because this book reads so easily that it's like a novel and you just forget what you're reading. So you have to know what to look for as you're reading it, because otherwise you don't stand a chance at the test, which is also very interesting. But that, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So it, it is possible, yeah. Okay. but yeah. Yeah, it's just rare. I mean, yeah, 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 something else. Uh, yeah, well, uh, okay. I, so I guess what I'm taking away is, you don't have any great answers either. 
I don't have an answer either. No, no. And I, I think what you said is very fair. I think you 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 have to assess in the case of an, of a biography of what you are looking for. If it is the complete factual knowledge of well, this is when they were born and this is what they did and they married five times and they had seventeen children. Like that, that, if that's what you're looking for, you can get it. But if what you're looking for is the juice of someone's life and what made them tick and what you know, that kind of stuff, that can be a different purpose in in yeah. in a book and something else entirely. Yeah, I, I guess. I know that it's so hard to get like last, I think last time we talked, I, I told you my little four part rubric on mm -hmm. how I work out facts from truths and whatnot. And I know that getting that truth is super difficult, but getting at facts is a little bit less difficult when it comes to things that actually physically happen. Yeah. So, um, so I guess I tend to just say, well, give me the facts and I'll yep. think it through. And if I want to go somewhere in particular, you know, that'd be okay. Like with Rachmaninoff, I know there's that fun little bit about the, I don't know if you heard about this, but Rachmaninoff had a somewhat famous failure out of his first symphony. I haven't uh, heard that. No. Rachmaninoff, as, as a composer, he was a kind of a gifted student. And as he was going through the Moscow Conservatory, it was kind of like, you know, he got everything right. He almost could do no wrong nothing but a positive future for this kid. He, uh, I think he won what they call their great gold medal um, mm -hmm. for his first opus one, his first piano concerto, which was not bad uh, for a student. And then I think his opus two was this symphony in D minor and everyone was looking forward to it. And for one reason or another, it didn't go so well. And it, uh, you know, his, his, little fragile ego just went crumbling all the way down. And there was all these apocryphal stories maybe of him taking a score and he left before the concert was finished and he dashed the score into the river and, you know, he couldn't get out of bed for a long time and he had to get hypnosis to be able to work up enough energy to carry on nice. and, you know, make him, you know, there's this great story, which I am stunned. No, I have not heard of the movie of this. This is yes. begging to be turned into a movie, but, uh, you know, it would be really interesting to read the biography of, so what were those troubling years of his life like after the failure of the first symphony but yep. before the second piano concerto? Yeah. Uh, and that is, to me, that's a matter of, it is emotionally charged to me, knowing the trajectory of his life, but I wonder on the day-to-day -day level, what was it like to be around Rachmaninoff when he couldn't get off the couch? Yeah. You know, you know that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And that's, that would be, yeah. the facts, just the facts, ma'am, would be dry but interesting yeah absolutely so, so. interesting very interesting yeah I, I i crave that sort of thing like what are the just you know give me the facts just give me the give me some facts and give me the facts that i that i that you don't hear about on the street yes you know? but uh but yeah okay so interesting yeah, I, that, that you know that's that, that's all i i really wanted to go with that but you know yeah no i like it I like it. Sure. I think that I think that is interesting. Okay, here's another one that you also sent. I last time uh, I think it may have not have been last time, maybe the time before, but we were talking about Eric Satie. Yeah, 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 satire with no R, right? Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. It was also. I believe there is a video of him on a rooftop somewhere, jumping up and down with an umbrella over his head, and nobody knows what the hell he was doing. Um, so, but yeah, that's in, we had in his own regard. Anyway, we were talking oh, about man. a Dutch, a Dutch uh, um, conductor and pianist, Reinbert Leeuw. I send you his specific rendition of the first gymnopedie. Uh -huh. What did you think? Because it is much, much slower than it is usually played. So either he nice. tore it to pieces, or he created a masterpiece out of it. What did you think? Because you're the pianist. Neither one. I think that speed is very much within range. I think it was... I mean, if somebody's complaining that that... I heard it. If someone wants to complain that it's too slow, mm -hmm. I think that person has too narrow a conception of what that piece can be. Uh, I think the performance was very nice. Was it excellent, in my opinion? Mm, not really. No, I mean, I think mm -hmm. I can imagine better, but it was very good, and it was it was lovely to listen to. Nothing too crazy, you know. Is it my favorite recording? I don't know that I have a favorite recording, mm -hmm. but it was nice, and it 
got me what I want to get when I say I want to listen to that piece. It did it. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's controversy averted. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I don't, yeah, I know. And even if it would be controversy, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's, it's, uh, indeed, it is slower. It would be interesting. Um, it, it reminds me there is a, um, uh, but now I'm struggling to remember his name. Um, ah, yes, there is a Dutch comedian called Hans Lieber, and he is. A classically trained musician, multi instrumentalist, plays the piano, plays other instruments, and it's very interesting because he does a he does comedy tours, comedy shows, where he makes jokes, but they're all related to music. And he plays the piano. He he. It's very hard to explain, but he incorporates the music into the humor. So I'll, I'll try to give you an example, and this this ties in for me to, to something you said about this rendition of Sati and it being within range. So one of his, his jokes is classical music is too long. And so here's why. So he said, what you, what, what, because you need to know with classical music when to stop. So he says, I will, I will now start to play and then you have to indicate when to stop because if you take classical music too far, it'll go on forever. So he starts to play Mozart and I can't, I mean, I can't, I don't, I don't play the piano and I can't sing, but basically it's something like, here's a piano concerto from Mozart. Here's what you get. Da, 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 and it just keeps no, going, man, you're going, 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 going. You're run, just, you, you, you run out of, you run out of keys, man. You change yes. keys. No, I've heard the Elvira Madigan piano concerto just as well, many times as the next guy. That piece... It flows because you wouldn't have that thought. Yes, no, you I, wouldn't I, I, think, I think to just. Yeah, and I think that's the comedy, right? That it, that it keeps going and going and going and going and going going into infinity, and indeed you run out of keys. But I thought I thought it's interesting because you it it it. To me, let me rephrase that. To me, what makes that that humor fascinating is that as someone who plays zero instruments, I find it interesting that you can, a, a, like a, a just adopt the music like adapt it i guess to just keep going 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 he does a lot of these things where he mixes classical pieces together and one flows seamlessly into another and that kind of stuff i find that fascinating so when you say this rendition of sati is within a normal range so to speak now i see what you mean like it can still it, it still works without it being destroyed you know it, the, the question is always do you break the musical line or not and probably the closest analog is uh, how long can you pause or how long can you spread apart your words in a sentence before people can't understand what you're saying? Yes. And it's, it's really, it's really pretty much that if you stretch things uniformly, there is a point for every sentence wherein we will lose what you're trying to say. Yeah. Um, if I, if the sentence was the, And that's okay. Yeah. But if the sentence is super complex, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, you'll yeah. forget what I was talking about. So the question is, can you stretch the musical line? Sure. And I think for that Satie piece, the musical line is, it's long, but it's kind of thin. Mm -hmm. It's it just, you know, it, it's not, everything is not tightly related to one another. It's not a Beethoven sonata where every phrase is building on the last one you heard and you have to repeat the damn thing just so that you can make sure that you got the point. It's not that. It's kind of many related thoughts, somewhat loosely connected. Somewhat yep. loosely connected, right? So I think that piece has a lot of flexibility. So you can go... Bum, 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 bum. Uh, you know, that's that's pretty fast for that piece. And then you could take it bum 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 you know, something like that. And I think the sound, it still generates a character that's still worth listening to. And mm -hmm. I kind of like it like that because 
you're getting something in between the pauses. It's not yeah. just there, there's no gaps of nothing as it's just spacious and big and that's okay. So I think that piece has a lot of flexibility. Some pieces do not have great flexibility. There is a much tighter range wherein you can play the um, the uh, bagatelle without opus number. Uh, we call Furelise. Pretty tight. Um, people sometimes try to play the first movement of the Arbor Sonata, uh, Opus 27, number two by Beethoven. Uh, some people like to try to play that piece with a big range. Some people play super slow, super fast. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, it, it, you know, the range is smaller than most people, I think, think it, think it should be. And I think the professionals, they don't waste their time. They get through it. They just, they tend to play it faster than I think some, some people do when they're super romanticizing and want to milk every last right. note for all of its juice. Because it's not necessarily giving you that same kind of sonic space like the Satie can. In between those gaps, like you're plodding along with these slow triplets, there's not a lot going on. You're, right. The, the movement happens on a bigger scale, not note by note like it can in the Satie. Two notes, ah, you've already got an invite, you've already yeah. got an, um, an atmosphere. So it's so that I think you know ranges can vary. So that's what that's what I mean on that. Uh, there was something else I was going to say. What was that? Ah, uh, probably doesn't matter. Anyway, so so yeah, the city, uh, yeah, I like it. Um, I still like it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting. I find it. This is something that I that I, as an, a a non musician, that that I have, I have often found is a very important aspect to me of. Uh, of of much of classical music, especially when it comes to say piano pieces, which have a very I don't even know what the technical term for this is, but like it's a very on off characteristic. Like a tone is played or is not played, and there's, there's there's nothing in between. It's not something that it lingers in the air, sure for for a little bit, but it's but it's it's gone. And I I think that certain people, certain composers, have manage to to create pieces to compose pieces that the 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 time in between the notes matters as much as as the actual notes the 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 the, the silence they create is an important part of of uh, the 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 music and and one composer is actually a modern modern composer but someone who always comes to my mind when i think of these things is um uh, arvo pert Paired, P A M L T R T. Yes, I, I, I know. I, paired. I mean, it's paired right there. Paired, boom. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, and I think he he has elevated that to to in my mind an almost superhuman capacity to to play with the silence in the music as much as as with the music, giving a very sometimes a very. Um, a strange effect without slipping into the 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 atonality that I associate with some modern composers who can be very uh, very. I think Perto is does, a, does an interesting, and I don't like all of his music, but I do always find it fascinating. There's, you know, I I only know a little Perto, and the few pieces that I've heard I really like. Mm -hmm. uh, I I, I want to spend a little bit more time on Perto, but. You know, I, I something I don't I can't remember right now, but something has been occasionally pushing me away from spending more time on it. I think the way that I listen to music now is a little bit is isn't isn't the same as I used to be when when I was when I was in college. I listened to everything because you have lots of time. You know, lay on your bed, put the headphones on, and you know, let stuff play. But uh, I, I now I listen to music in my workshop a lot, mm -hmm. and it. Uh, you lose a lot of detail and you don't have the constant attention span to devote yeah. to some things. Yeah. So if I'm going to listen to something like, for example, there are podcasts that I absolutely love that I can't really listen to when I'm working because I'll be f going back 15 seconds the whole time because I can't, yeah. Yeah. because I'm, my attention's distracted. But I, I do like, I, you know, the bits I, I to spend some more time on parrot and, uh, you know, let you know what I come up with. I, I think I I like this Passacaglia, 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like that. Um, as far as you know, composers who deal with space go. I mean, I think I may have not to sound uh, cheap or anything, but I, I I would like to throw my uh, throw Max Richter's hat into the ring. Familiar with Max Richter? Max I know Richter. him by name, but I'm I'm thinking if I ever if I have any pieces that immediately come to mind, and that I don't think so. You know, none of the names of his pieces come to mind at all. I can't think of any. They have these kind of atmospheric, generic, right. you know, names that don't go anywhere. As as as, as do the works of Nils Fromm, um, mm-hmm. a modern composer that I really like. They both they use a they don't give a lot of space in terms of silence, but they definitely give music. They write music that's more minimal, where there's a lot where the space in the music comes from the duration of repetition and the yeah. subtle variations. And I think the, uh, you know, Max Richter, Nils Fromm, and while we're at it, Olafur Arnolds and James Blake, the electronic composer, I think those guys, man, oh man, if I walked home and I saw Max, Max Richter, James Blake, Olafur Arnold, I mean, I, I, I don't even know what I would do. I, 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 I mean, I was like, is this an intervention? Why are all my favorite guys here? You know, nice. but, but, uh, but but they give but their music really just in general it's just so so spacious you know really it's it's just really it is spacious but they but none of them really play with silence in any appreciable degree not in the same kind of way that beethoven would give you passion in the absence of sound like yeah. in say one of his late slow movements for example or the end of the hammer clavier um, yeah, but 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 totally worth listening to. And those guys, I can listen to in my workshop because if you miss five seconds, it's okay. Yes. You know, yeah. It, it, yeah, and and that's kind of what I need these days. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. Here's a here's a question which is uh, I think uh, um, still on the topic of music, but this is the final. I wanted to ask you this question. We were talking about this not last time, the time before that, but. Far be it from me to single out any one person, but here is a person whom I think <clears throat> is either loved or hated. And as a, as a pianist, what about Glenn Gould? What is your opinion on Glenn Gould? Which is not to get some sort of spectacular thing out of you. I'm just genuinely curious. <laughs> what do you think of Glenn Gould? Well, we're talking about Glenn Gould, the, the pianist, or Glenn Gould, the man? Well, I think Glenn Gould, the man, is a very complicated topic. I think he was a complicated person, and that's, I'm okay with that. You can be complicated, but as an interpreter, as a pianist, what do you think of Glenn Gould? Well, the ways in which I evaluate a pianist, what are they? I, I, I would start with, how's his technique? Just basically, is he sloppy or not? Mm-hmm. You know, um, overall... How do I like his overall sound? How do I like his interpretations? And how do I like him, if it's if applicable, how do I like him in concert? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, could, I should probably say a few people, so you get a sense of where I'm coming from. So, Long Long, Chinese pianist, he's yep. got great technique. Um, overall sound, every second is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, I take issue with almost everything that he's done because I feel like he he gives and take with his usage of time capriciously, and mm-hmm. I don't like that. I might be stingy, conservative, but you know that's just I, you know when he interprets, I tend to. I, you know, there's not a rhyme or reason for why he bends and twists and compresses yep. when he does to me. Mm-hmm. And in concert, I find him hilariously distracting because he can't sit still and he's tossing his hands and, you know, he's, he's waving his long hair and, you know, and it's, and it's all nice. It's, it's, I suppose it's fun if you don't know what's going on, but if you do know what's going on, I'm thinking, come on, man, sit still. Um, is it is it possible is it possible that this is a case of hair envy? When um, we are completely honest, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it's 
it's not possible because uh, Walter Geisiking was bald. Uh, Ma- um, Sviatoslav Richter was also bald. Um, Myron nice. Hess's hair was totally uninspiring, and that's fine with me. It's it, it no no I'm gonna say nice. no, no, no I'm just kidding. I, 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 I appreciate awesome it. it. Nice try though. Nice try, bro. Nice try. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, so that's how I so that's how I kind of feel about long line. So overall, as yeah. overall as a guy, like, and then finally the the final question is, would you pay to see it? Yeah. And yeah. Would I pay to see long line? I would. Pay, I think I paid once, so I mm-hmm. could know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've seen him a few times, but I didn't pay all, all the times. Um. Uh. So so that that gives you an idea where I'm coming from. As far as Ben Gould, okay, technique, fantastic. Love his technique. Love the clarity. Overall sound. I can trust the overall sound on quite a bit of repertoire, but I don't always want to be hearing it. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. You know, like, <laughs> do I want to listen to Barack Obama give a commencement speech? Sure. Mm-hmm. Do I want to be Michelle Obama listening to Barack Obama whisper sweet nothings before we get down? Not if he sounds like he does on behind the podium. Yes, I yes. No, I understand. Uh, yeah, let yeah. Me, uh, br- I'm going to break it down for you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that would be a disturbing thought. Yeah. Barack Obama, get, getting down. Oh, okay. So, Glenn Gould, with his sound overall, here we are, Peter Stevens Show. Welcome, everybody. Um, when I listen to him playing Bach, almost always it works. When I listen to him playing Ravel, oh, uh, you know, oh gosh, it's 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 it. No, I, I don't like the way he sounds on Ravel. Um, him on Beethoven sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Um, um, Glenn Gould playing Debussy, uh, I don't think so. Um, so overall, it depends. But again, I like that I can trust him to be good at this. I can trust Glenn Gould's box sound to be up my alley. And as opposed to someone like Edwin Fisher, whose box sound is very beautiful, but I could just kind of go, you know, you kind of go dull on it. I mean, it's like, he, you know, the way he sounds, when he plays Bach, it's like the overall sumptuous tone. You know, if he were playing Chopin, he'd do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's not necessarily wrong. It's just for Glenn Gould, it works there, and it's kind of special. With others, with someone like Edwin Fisher, who was a renowned Bach interpreter, it's not necessarily super special. Um, but, you know, in my humble opinion. Uh, so, what was that? Technique, overall sound, interpretations. Uh, hit or miss. You know, one recording of the Goldberg variations of Gould was nice. Another one was sounding like you're getting a little carried away with yourself, man. Mm-hmm. Why are you doing this? Yes. You know, uh, I mean, I, I'm point. not, yeah. I'm, I'm not thrilled. I mean, some, oh man, you know, like the C minor prelude from the first book of the Well Tempered Clavier. Okay, that tone that you're using there can work. It's captivating. You got mm-hmm. us pinned to the edge of our seats. Okay, uh, but like I, sometimes he, he's like pulling these moves that are so slow. You know, I know it's slow, but you're going so slowly. Um, have you forgotten why we're here? Right. Uh, right. You know, I like a video recording of him playing the art of the fugue. Mm-hmm. And it's, I, I have no issue with any of that there. But uh, generally, it depends on the piece. Depends on the piece and depends on the recording. And I think uh, he's he's on the record saying that he didn't like <clears throat> performing live and prefer the recording studio because he says that he didn't like the way for having the, the way the performing forced him to feel and made him behave during performance, you know, where you're on, you're kind of like a stage, like a trained monkey and you're over there doing this thing, trying to get this reaction out of the audience that everybody paid for. And it kind of can sometimes pull you into these tracks that you don't necessarily want to be doing. And I can, uh, I can imagine how somebody who feels that way would, potentially do a little bit better in the recording studio mm-hmm, yeah. and, and 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 the glenn gould recordings i mean it depends on the piece but generally you know i i, I like it and now what about my thoughts on seeing them live 
I imagine he'd be terribly fun to watch because he doesn't wiggle around gratuitously for a guy sitting 14 inches off the floor. Yes. You know, it, it's not gratuitous. He's not tossing his hair back and careening, you know. You know, he's not being crazy. Uh, but uh, he, he could be fun to watch. Never got the chance, though. Would I pay to see Glenn Gould if he were alive? Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Uh, why, why do you ask? Dare I say? No, I, I find it. I, I find it. Yeah. First of all, that was. I think that was a, a fantastic and and very nuanced, well well thought out answer. So I, I I really I really enjoy that. Well done, Pierre. Well done. Bonus points. Um. But but no. I, what I find fascinating about him is that he he seems to be sanctified by some people vilified by other people and and i find i just find it fascinating i i i had i've had recordings of him which i am pretty sure were the das volte klavier and i have heard his goldberg variations also very interesting and what, but i had only heard of this controversy surrounding him I had never seen him in action, and at some point, I I found a recording. Uh, it's not hard to find on YouTube of the fifth piano concerto from Beethoven, and that has a, I find that an absolutely stunning second movement. That's very slow. That's very I, I find that a beautiful, beautiful piece of music. And he was playing it, and and he was. Pop, 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 making these sorts of sounds and, and motions as he was doing it and going somewhat, I don't want to say ballistic, but going very, very much into the, this whole motion pretty much like this. <laughs> and, and it was it was fascinating to watch. And I'm absolutely not trying to ridicule him because I, I, I think, yes, it's I, I, I'm not the right person to judge that. But yes, it sounded to me like his technique was was flawless was was the way he performed it was was flawless but it was the the i found it fascinating to see how someone was that became that absorbed into the music especially that movement and was completely engrossed in it which i would imagine it's not uncommon if you're a performing musician but but it was fascinating to me to see well so as far as the the gyrations and the 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 bucking uh I can tell you as a pianist, once you know the piece that you're doing, there's all the limit of how far you can take your gesticulation is limited only by your ability as a pianist. Right. You can take this, like you can, you know, we can talk about like jumping up, doing backflips, bouncing back into the chair. And if you can do it on time, you can do it. Right. Um, right. So, so that's, you know, that's, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I wouldn't be too impressed with, how far a person can get swept up in themselves yeah, because yeah, you know they're, they're not really getting swept up they're always in the moment they're just yes moving. um yeah glenn gould controversy you know the concept of i'll tell you you know i i know somebody who talks about having fights with their boyfriend and when i tell her it's not really a fight. Mm -hmm. You mean a disagreement? You might have a heated discussion, but a fight you did not have. A fight is where you want something and the other person doesn't want that or vice versa. And you exert every amount of your power into getting that out. Yes. And yes. There's a loser and there's a winner. Yeah. And, you know, that's probably not what you were trying to do. You weren't trying to subjugate your partner. You were just having an unpleasant discussion. And I think when it comes to controversies in, in the, in, in, as, a, as it pertains to music, about the only controversy that I can think of that I would call a real controversy, mm -hmm. I mean, everything else is just pontiff. And I, I've read a lot, of con a lot of comments on videos and on message boards about classical music. It's, it's just people who have an opinion. And sometimes yeah. some people want to sound smart. You know, they throw in a bunch of fancy words and, and some people just say, I like this. I don't like this. I don't, I, you know, this thing may have to do with the music. This thing may not. 
Um, yeah. But the only real controversy that I could really, that I would call a controversy, or that's anything that's real and worth kind of talking about because of the story, mm-hmm. is the plagiarism controversy uh, yeah. from yeah. like 10 years ago. Did you hear about this? Not sure. Not sure. Uh, there, there was uh, a number of years ago, there was a woman who I believe was releasing re- recordings from her late husband mm-hmm. and selling them and whatnot. And it, it turned out that they were all plagiarized recordings by other pianists who were poorly known right. that had been time altered. Mm. Interesting. So that the, so that the, the digital rights management wouldn't immediately yeah. catch as, as yeah. something messed yeah. up. So she would bend and tweak a little bit where it didn't matter so that you wouldn't know. Yeah. And then she got yeah. found out. That was a real controversy. But outside of that, eh, man, it's, it's all opinion. Like uh, there's a, there's a, I was talking on, uh, on Instagram, on an Instagram live chat a while ago about one guy who, with one guy who knows a little bit about classical music. And we were talking mm-hmm. about a, a pianist uh, named Katya Bonyatishvili. And she's obviously Georgian. But, uh, you know, she's uh, well endowed. And it was, and for classical music, that's like extraordinarily uncommon. And, right. you know, people were, like, there's a video of her playing a symphony where she's not long, 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 longing or right. Lynn Goulding. She's not going crazy, but she's putting a little bit of spice into the right. performance. Yeah. But because of the aforementioned fact, it came out really well. And, right. and there are people commenting about that up and down, you know, so and so, oh, you need to stay in the dress. You need to wear this. You can't go on to a concert stage and be expected to be taken seriously doing nice. all this. And I'm yeah. like, you don't even know how sexist you're being, man. If Long Long did that same shit, you wouldn't be talking about this. You yeah. just don't like the fact that she's got boobs. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, but and that's that's not controversy. That's just people on a classical message board but, but that's but very interesting it, yeah. that i find that a very interesting topic so that that because yes we we associate i think performances of classical music with with dinner jackets and yeah yeah exactly and with with it all has to be uh, you know tuxedoed up so to speak but then when Look Look at the average video clip of any pop star, any pop star at all, and it's basically softcore porn. So I mean, it's like it's it's fine. like i don't I don't care. but 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 then what what's the difference? Is it a matter that classical music is associated with a certain level of elitism, and we all need to dress up for that. But when we go to a Britney Spears concert, we can wear a hot pants. Like I mean, I can't wait to get my hot pants to go to a Britney Spears concert, <laughs> man, but you know, but it's like but like that. It's this is a very this is a very disturbing image. I myself am disturbed at this point. But in any case, like <laughs> that, I do find that interesting. That at that point, it becomes, it's about something completely different than I think yeah. what it really should be about. That discussion. Gosh, you know, I would when I heard that the opera house in Austria has standing room only seating or standing room only standing for people who can't afford much. Yeah. I thought I would just love it if we could take classical music and just bring it down to where people can enjoy it. You yeah. know, uh, I, I think I saw some performances of uh, one of my favorite pianists who's alive, Marc-Andre Amna. Uh, he was doing a, it looked like a performance inside a bar. People had mm-hmm. drinks. Nobody was wearing a suit. Everybody was, they looked nice like they were going to go out on the night, but they weren't dressed up or anything. Everybody had a drink. They were relaxed. And I think all we needed them to do was just not talk. Yeah. That I would say, don't talk, but yeah, just have a good time. Bring you know, bring the music where the people are. Yeah, I would love to do that. I one of my favorite ways to do a concert is where you're in somebody's house. They got a nice piano, and you have everybody just right in, right on yes. top of you. And that is so much <sighs> coronavirus. Can't do that. I know. can't have that. I know. You know. That's, that was one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah. To have like, where every it's literally like like everybody's on top of you practically. Uh, but now yeah, so I'll try not to limit that too much. But but you know that's that's the thing that we should be able to. I think the music, the music can support it. I, I don't have any problem with that. The people who do have a problem with that, 
I wonder if it's not embedded in some type of classism. Probably yeah. racism is involved somewhere, yep. somehow, because it usually is. But yeah, it's, I, it's, think, it's I bad, think so. Really. I don't know if you're familiar with there. There is a in in the Netherlands a very famous uh, violin player called André Rieu, and um, no, he 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 he. R i l l e. R i e u Rieu, and he. He's very interesting because he he broke through like he he made it he he made it like he broke through by playing the second waltz of Shostakovich a fairly ran, not not the, the immediate the violin piece I would think about but he but he played that and I think the reason it, he broke through with it is he played it for it's really weird I think it was a beer commercial with an actual waltz, like the type of waltz that you use to like like flatten pieces of a road. It, like it was really random. But then of course he launched that as a video clip, him playing that 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 small movement from that 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 symphony. And he now has fame. He tours the world. He has his own his own orchestra. He has singers. He has everything. And they play all kinds of Baroque pieces, but sometimes they play kind of popular pieces, The Lonely Shepherd, he gets a guy with a pan flute come on stage and he plays and then he's... So it's all it's all very showy and they wear, they wear period costumes and they wear you know, those kinds of things. But here's the thing, though. When you look at him... I'll send you a video when we're done. Um, when you look at him perform, first of all, it's often outdoors like either it's it's giant football stadiums it's massive market squares it's these kinds of things hundreds and hundreds of people show up and these are people who are not dressed up these are people just wearing their north face coats just standing there and sort of humming along but but what is interesting about it is that for myself just just reasoning from my own perspective i initially saw these things on television i thought oh my god what a sellout this dude is like he's just but then i thought but wait a minute he is playing all these famous tunes that people know that people love famous classical bits of a bit of baroque bit of this bit of that and he gets people to really enjoy that music hundreds of people sometimes thousands of people in big big uh, venues and he gets them to really have a great time. And when you look at the faces of people in the audience, they're all laughing, they're all smiling, they're all having a fantastic time. And then I thought, but doesn't that matter more? Like, forget about, is it commercial? Yeah, it's commercial. This is his income. This is how he makes a so living. What, man? But exactly. So what? But that's how he does it. And he, he popularizes that music. He exposes entire generations, in my mind, to a type of music that they might not have heard otherwise. So I think it's actually really neat. It's fascinating. Yeah. You know, I, uh, gosh, there's a pianist, Jeffrey Siegel, I think. He does what he calls keyboard conversations, trademarked. Mm -hmm. And he gives you, he basically gives you the lecture concert. You know, I'm going to play this, listen to this, this is what's going on in this, here's a little backstory, replay it, clap, clap, yay, right. here's the next piece, same deal. And I think that's, some people would call it, not some people, I don't want to be one of these people, but I've heard the phrase edutainment. Right, oh, nice. That, yeah. that stupid edutainment. theologism. Edutainment. Yeah. And, nice. and I think that's, fundamentally, it's, you know, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to do? And I think you can, if you want to educate while you entertain, that's fine. But if you go, if you're one of those people who goes out and claims to be giving concerts because you're interested in educating the public. Mm -hmm. I think you need to go to a school. I don't think people go to a concert. I don't think anybody in the world goes to a concert because they want education. If you want education, yeah. go to a museum, go to school, yeah. Yeah. Uh, community college. But no, we go because we want to have a good time. Yeah. And I go because I want to have a good time. So, uh, and if you're going to educate, I mean, if you're going to entertain, entertain however you can dream up a way to do it. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that's, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm okay with however you want to do it. Um, the only issue I have probably is just to re reaffirm my position in the world of being a musical conservative <clears throat> mm -hmm. is when people take the music and they, they do things to what the composer wrote. 
like um, if the piece of music um, was written and in the score was requested flashing lights mm -hmm. smoke machine <laughs> um, nude woman yeah runs across here lasers being fired yeah. right right preferably from the jubblies yeah yeah if if the music says that go with it but if it doesn't say that i do take issue with people taking someone else's work someone's someone wrote down this music used a piece of their life to do it and then using it as a vehicle for putting on their own you know something or other yeah i i i, I take strong issue with that because i write music and you know i i just me personally if i write a piece of music and i caught somebody taking it and then turning it into a vehicle for themselves to, yep. yep i don't know what i i would just take issue with it because i would say i very clearly did not say i want you to do this on the page yep. yeah yeah what makes you think that i'd be okay with this and if you don't care about what i think why don't you yeah maybe you sh maybe you shouldn't play my stuff yeah. Why don't you care? I, I mean, I I might be dead, but gosh, it's pretty obvious in what I wrote that I didn't necessarily intend this thing. Yeah, but, but but that's that makes pretty sense. much the only issue. That, that's well, that's you know, it's it's super subjective. Uh, but I think I, that's about the only thing that I have a real hard problem with. No, but I understand that because you're 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 taking something and you are. I think it's it's a thin line between doing something, performing something in a way that may popularize it, whatever that means, but like make it more well known with a certain audience that might not have been exposed to it or this kind of stuff, or turning it into something that it was clearly never meant to be. And I, 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 I recently I found on YouTube a a rendition of I think this is a fair example of Toccata und Fuge D moll by Bach organ piece often misused right the the, the horror the which one you mean the or you mean the Dorian Toccata you wrote a lot of okay yeah okay. yeah the horror the, the classic horror movie the, the crazy insane person professor typically plays or the vampire or whatever plays that piece on the big organ in in the in the castle we know this piece okay i find this a very fascinating piece of music i really like it i found a version of it not for church organ, but for an a cappella group of singers. There is no organ. They sing it. They sing the whole mm. piece. Mm. And not only do they sing it, they sing the text of Stabat Mater, which is a religious piece. Uh, the, you know, the mother was standing, crucifixion, crying, tears, blood, etc. So they sing that text to that melody. And that makes it something completely different. Now, I have to admit... I listened to it out of, at that point, almost morbid fascination of where the hell, where the hell is this going and why are you doing this to that piece of music? But it was fascinating. I would not, would I not? No, I would judge, I, honestly, I would judge them a little bit. I would judge them a little bit because that is taking that piece of music to a place that is so strange and that in my mind makes so little sense that I don't know. I feel like maybe if what, what okay, Stephen. What if they had sung it on ooh? What if they had just none, no lyrics, just sung it with voices? I think at that point, it would have made more sense to me personally. More made more sense to me because it would still be something completely different. But you do not also add a text that has nothing to do with it. I have nothing against Stabat Mater. I think there are beautiful renditions of the Stabat Mater, but I think that in this case. Now a lot of different things get conflated here that I, I that in my mind I, like I don't know like I mean maybe you and I should record a version of the gymnopedie with the text of the requiem and just see what happens when you know 
I, I don't know. And see what, what, you know, what, 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 how many people would watch that would go viral. I can tell you now that would go viral. Anyway, so, oh, that, yeah, so at some point, <laughs> at some point to me, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense anymore. And if you enjoy that type of music, I would never judge you. It's just that for me, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't get behind that really you know it, everybody has their you know their boundaries uh, you know yours might be a little tighter in that way to let that whole thing in I'm I'm always in the perspective of all right does it work mm -hmm. you know and have you thought about do you think how do you think the composer would look at what you're doing yeah and, yeah and then and I th and I know you you can't know that for sure this is a truth not a fact but you can I think you can make informed, educated guesses. Yeah. Like if, 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 if you're playing Chopin mm -hmm. on the piano in a bar to a listening audience. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, Chopin, you know, it's piano. It's the same instrument. You're just moving it. And, and realistically, Chopin played in rooms with people next to him all the time. Yeah. No question about that. Um, doing something like... Well, you might just as well ask. Okay, so Beethoven wrote the, his Ninth Symphony the, with the Ode to Joy, yeah, the folk yeah, yeah. movement, uh, for full choir, full orchestra. Well, suppose you don't have the money for that, but you mm -hmm. can afford six friends who can sing, and you play the piano, and you rework it all to go into piano and six voices. That's not what he said. How would he feel about you doing that? And I think if you, if I got the impression that you did it diligently and it worked, mm -hmm. I don't know. If it works, I like to think that a composer would be okay if it works. If it sounds like it doesn't work, he wouldn't be okay with it, even if you did more or less the same thing but did it differently. Like if yep, you had yep. the same voices, the same piano, but you didn't do it right. Yeah. Um, I think the question is, does it work? And I think composers, like you asked me a while ago about creativity, mm -hmm. I think creativity is potentially just interesting, just another way of talking about problem solving. I think every composer wants it to work. Um, you know, you know, in the process of creating something, you try things, some things fail, some things don't. And, you know, you're trying to find something that works. And so I think if it works, I could live with that. Um, the thing with the, the choir, with the Takata and Fugue, with new lyrics, you know, I, what if it worked? I mean, yeah, it's weird, you know. You, you might have to be okay with something that you, on its face, both do and do not accept. I don't, yeah. you know, I don't accept people just, like, taking a piece of music that I wrote where I specifically did not write lyrics and then jamming lyrics in. Uh but if it creates a nice effect, maybe. Is that the effect that I was hoping to create when I wrote this piece? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of special. Um, do you mind if I ask you a music question? No, go ahead. Have you heard of Victor Borgia? Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't hear that. I did. Have, have you heard of Victor Borgia? Yes, I have. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, if we're talking about the same person, this was also kind of like music and and a bit of bit of comedy. And, and right, talking, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, he, yeah I a, have. Yeah, you know, I think I, I wanted to bring this up when you were talking about. Um, sorry, music sorry. The reason, yeah. sorry, the reason I had to ask if I heard that correctly is what I heard was, "Have you had an abortion?" And I thought, I, I, I don't, oh, I don't think I've had an abortion. No. But okay, we're good. We're good. We're good, and we're on the same page. Yes. Uh, that's great. Oh, <laughs> Let's that's not worry fun. about that. That's another oh. five hours of material. Material, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so Victor Borgia, uh, for those who, who haven't heard of him, he's a he's a pianist who found more success as a stand-up comic. And I think some of the videos of Victor Borgia's comedy, basically using music as this vehicle for his own, yeah. you know, for his own comedy. I I go back and forth on on the one hand, I think it's some funny stuff. Um, but I wouldn't go to a Victor Borgia concert because I wanted to hear music, though. So. Mm -hmm. I would go because I wanted to hear comedy. And, and I think it's kind of, and I've heard a lot of people doing humor with music, and it can, and it can definitely work, but I've heard a lot of stuff that doesn't work. So mm -hmm. if you're a comedian, I'd like it if you could send a link out or maybe put one yeah. in the description. 
yeah. see if it see if it works because that's I think that's tricky because man you know I think comedy works by communicating things that you know we're talking about stuff that doesn't make sense comedy yeah. is you know kind of absurd but music we're asking for things that are abstract for you to make sense of them and if I'm being and if I'm in an audience and I'm both being pulled in the direction of absurdity it's kind of hard to stay focused when I'm trying to sit back and enjoy the and enjoy the uh, you know the beautiful sounds washing over me yeah which I, so so that's something I've, I've never people when I was in college people have told me Pierre you know you'd be really funny if you were doing performance like that but it's like uh, it's like mixing things that I don't want to mix yeah um, yeah yeah uh, so I was going to ask you about Victor Borgia and uh, yeah, yeah do, does musical comedy work? Yeah, yeah. So those are my thoughts. Do you have any thoughts on if music and comedy can play together? Uh, yeah, I, I find it very interesting because I have seen some of his work. Um, I also found uh, I found his style uh, quite quite um, quite comical. I think he has a very uh, um, in my mind, it's 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 kind of a funny sketch where he basically does he shows people what opera is like. So he does he does the tenor and he does the you know he does the the the, the female the singer doing some aria and he does all this stuff very shortly. And in my in my mind, it's 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 quite comical. But indeed, then it becomes then the music becomes a vehicle for the comedy. And although I think that that can be, it can be successful, and I can also, there are definitely examples that I find really funny. Um, it is a, it is a peculiar type of comedy. It's not a sitcom. It's not really stand-up comedy. It's not really, it's something where, where the music has become, Pardon, has yeah. become part of the act and that and that's interesting i once read um i once read a review of once upon a time in the west the movie uh, um famous spaghetti western and and he and the the um, the reviewer said what's so special about this movie is that the landscape has been made an actor in this movie and i thought whoa that's a really cool way to put this so now every time i see that movie I think, yeah, I see what you mean. Like they have such panning shots of the entire landscape that that landscape has become a very integral part of that movie. I understand that in this type of musical comedy, the music becomes part of the comedy, becomes a, like you, you might have a character in a sketch or something, the music becomes that. And I think it can be successful. I also think that it can, it, it, it can absolutely not work. So it depends on the audience. So for example, the same comedian, comedian I, I um mentioned Hans Lieberg. He is Dutch. He has performed a lot. He speaks German quite fluently. He has performed a lot in Germany. I once saw a, if that is subtitled, then I, I would I would definitely send it to you. He did a very a short, short bit, like, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes um, for a, a German TV uh, show. It was, it was a live audience and it was clear that the audience didn't get a single joke. And it wasn't because he wasn't he wasn't conveying like it wasn't it wasn't a language barrier, but they didn't know the musical pieces. They didn't know what he was. He uses a lot of classical music, and he kind of uses that, incorporates that, makes fun of some of the stuff in classical music. But if you don't know the original piece, then you don't understand why it's it's funny when he he misses a note or when he extends it or when he does because you don't know what the original sounds like. So I think that in such a case, then then that can also fall flat in its face. And that's probably not the only way that can happen. But I mean, that is an important thing. You do expect then that the reader, it's the same as, as a, a, an author who, who parodies specific writings. If you do not know those writings, then you don't understand why it's funny. You know? And I, I, so I think that with the, the musical stuff, that, that can happen and can be a big issue. And, you know, I would say that's a failure. Of the, I mean, that, that's the part where it doesn't work. And as and as, uh, and as I, I, I'm afraid to open the floodgates here, but as a guy who's written a, uh, a stand-up bit or two just to try mm -hmm. out, I, I can tell you that's a thing you don't want to happen. You want yeah. it to be able to work on any room that you know that you can play in. Uh, if you and you shouldn't have to know anything, 
ideally you shouldn't have to to get what's i mean yeah. it's not like you can't get something out of it but you want to be able to get what i intended you to get yeah and I, i'd say that's a that's a failure we might have to have a talk with this guy uh, yeah it's too bad <clears throat> um yeah it's too bad yeah maybe maybe we should do edutainment with him <laughs> uh, uh, we'll continue yeah, yeah, it's, it's too bad. It's too bad, you know. But I do I like I do I do like the idea because I, again, it, it to me is also a way of. I think that often, classical music, especially in, among younger generations, can have a very stuffy nature, stuffy character. And, and let's let's just put it on it. When we say younger generations, uh, can you confirm that you are not a baby boomer? I can confirm that this is the case. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, roughly, how old are you? I, well, I'm exactly, in fact, thirty-five years old. Okay, and I am exactly thirty-six. Well, there you go. So, so, so when we say younger generation, yes, I'll, I'll take that for what it's worth. Yes. So Very even younger, great. even younger than we are. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and and I I think that's important, and and with with other people too. But I mean that. That that stuffiness, I think, ties into what we were talking about before. As long as you keep emphasizing, oh, this has to be incredibly, these performances have to be incredibly elitist. And if you don't wear a tuxedo, you won't get in. And if you don't like th this kind of stuff, I wonder what the function of that is. Is it? A fun night out to go to the opera and dress up. I understand that aspect of it, but I think that also holds back certain people. Like, yeah, I'm not going to dress up for this shit. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, I. If I can interject, can I tell yeah. you a real quick story? I had a composition professor tell me that he, what was it, years ago, he heard an advertisement on the classical music station in Chicago, mm -hmm. and it was an, it was, you know, the station is WFMT. And they did this, they do their, re, they read the announcements just like in the good old days. And yep. it was an advertisement for some wealth management company. Mm -hmm. you know, how to manage your wealth, how to nice. ensure, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, man, I can't believe it. If I was some random kid who heard about classical music and turned on WFMT <laughs> for the first time and I heard this ad, I'm like, that's not for me. This is not yep. for me. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. And that, so that, that nature, that, that image I think if you can if you can turn I'm not saying that you have to turn every symphony into a comedy show I'm also not saying that you have to turn every symphony into edutainment I do like that term so I'm going to milk that one but like if you don't you don't have to do that but as long as you have that nature that image I think that is a problem you face, and I do think that that musical humor would be one way to expose people to. Oh, it actually sounds pretty cool. I should look that up. I should see what what piece that is. You know, you know, it's it's a real challenge because so many people already have this idea of classical music not being for them or yeah. being a certain thing, and you know, it, it, you you as a performer, you have to accept that people walk into the audience into the room with their own thoughts. Yeah, you know. And uh, I think that's going to be really hard to uh, to work in. I think some I've heard some good progress on that front. Um, well, depends on how you want to look at it. I've heard some good prog. I thought I heard some good progress on that front when it comes to uh, cartoons, which feature pretty hilarious orchestral yeah. scores. Uh, and there, there was a I think a program in Chicago where they would do classical music in back when we had audiences. I mm -hmm. think sometimes they did it outside, sometimes in a, in a room where you would watch the the cartoon with the background music that was live. Right, and right, right. How yeah. you know when you take a live orchestra who gets to be controlled by a conductor who knows who can feel the audience and you know really milk it. You know you can get kids who go wow, wow, yeah. wow, and 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 I think that's good. But you know you got to be careful that they don't end up thinking that that's the only thing that classical music is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, it's, let me ask you this: Why are we playing music that's two hundred years old? Why are we even doing this? Because we're writing it now. Yeah, yeah, and there is there are definitely alternatives now. I think it's music. Yeah, it's a fair question. Why would you Why would you keep something like that alive? I think 
to me a lot of a lot of classical music is uh, this sounds like a really um corny line but like it's 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 a, a lot of it is timeless to me it is timeless and it remains timeless it's music that that evoked something in people then even if these days it's played on a piano it was never written for a piano because the piano didn't exist yet you know like so it must have sounded differently but but uh, it it evoked something it was able to touch people in a way that they enjoyed that that added something to their lives and that I think it can still do. And I mean, you. I think I would be surprised if you've never had this experience be, being a, a musician, a, a performer and, and a composer. But I think any music, and that could be modern music, that can also be classical music. But given that we talk about classical music, I'll focus on that. I think music has the potential to to move us deeply to make us feel things that as you are listening, you you feel, you feel something, you feel emotions, emotions are evoked in you. And I, I find that there definitely is classical music, some of which has become so overused in all sorts of commercials and movies and whatever that, that you've become so overexposed to it that it, I feel that it's, it's kind of lost the meaning. But I do think there still are specific compositions, compositions that just just evoke a really, really strong feeling in people. You know, I feel like I don't want to sound like a doomsayer, uh, yeah. but I feel like the only place where I think in, in, in what I know, modern American society, yeah. where people go to feel feelings yeah. of the sort where, you know, classical music can make you feel stuff um you know, so classical music is sometimes some some of it is pleasant diversion to have on in the background some of it is i want to be moved mm -hmm. and some of it is just amuse me you know yeah. listen to this make me make me smile um probably the only time that i i can think of of people even being in positions where they can where those moods are what they seek out mm -hmm. I mean, when people listen to music, and sometimes I, I suppose sometimes people sit down, relax, turn the music on, and they can go for it. Uh, but I don't think we have a lot of opportunities like that. I don't think most people have the time mm -hmm. for that. I think, I think it's kind of left to the movies. Mm -hmm. like when we watch movies, you know, cinematic music can be can be kind of the same sort of can, can be there yeah. for it. But, yeah. but outside of that, I think, I don't think we have very many spaces because I know on the, like in the, and you know, 18th, 19th, early 20th century where there was no recording. Yeah. If you wanted something, you had to get it live and you had to be ready for it. And you'd look forward to it for the week. And otherwise there was no, there was no option. Yeah. But now our, our, our days are filled up with all sorts of stuff. People are working a lot, and it's just, I don't know, we don't have a lot of room for this kind of thing. I wonder, is there even a place in modern life for classical music? Not because I'm trying to get rid of it, uh, but I, I just don't see people really having the time, because it's not, it's not quite as, it's not, in general, it's not so accessible as turn it on real quick you get the point in a second it washes over you no questions asked like a, yeah like a like a pop song that you consume over yeah. three and a half minutes and boom you get your hit but you know it's generally it's it's not quite like that you know it's hard to find pieces that are that to the point Fury, release some really some of the super hits are but most of them aren't and we don't have i don't know i don't know the other room what do you what do you think? no i don't i don't think so either but i think that you you could you could take I, I agree i agree and i think that the music is 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 very different serves a very different function now than it used to um when i think back to the the generation of my my grandparents my my granddad was born 1919 so that gives you an idea um for them um 
music was an important thing. Now, both of my grandparents, like my, I'm talking about my maternal grandparents, they had hearing issues. So at some point they couldn't listen to recorded music very well anymore. But I remember for a long time, as I was a child, if I was in the car with my grandparents, classical music would be playing. It would be played in the car and you would listen. Like it doesn't mean you couldn't have a conversation, but that it was listening music. If they would do things, if they would uh, be, be relaxing in their home, there would often be classical music that was that was playing, recordings being played. They didn't have their own chamber orchestra for the record. So, I mean, it was like recordings you listened to. And I do think that that, that is disappearing unless you get into the sort of audio file type hobbies the people who set up their their multi thousand dollars equipment and then really do that to be immersed in this whole uh, um, sound escape of, of everything i think that has changed but i think there are many that, no well maybe i shouldn't say many i think there are other examples something that that comes to mind is i saw once a documentary about the head instructor of a Japanese school of swordsmanship in Japan, which is a very old lineage that goes all the way down to him. And he they showed his, they showed his life and his life was basically he gets up, he, he dons the traditional outfit, he goes to the dojo, he practices all the forms and then the students come in and he trains them all day and he does all the things he honors the uh, the founder of the school in a little shrine and he you know, the, the, all that stuff was part of his job and one of the interesting i found very interesting things was that a, a number of japanese people who studied with him were interviewed and at some point were asked so so why are you doing this? Because you're like you're learning you're learning sword fighting, and you will never ever use this in your life. Even if at some point you would be in some sort of self defense situation, you will not have a sword with you. You're not going to cut the guy's head off. Why not? You got to carry the sword. That's, yes, that's like the simplest solution. Yes, I don't know that, what the that would be. Is. Yes, always have your sword with you. But so, and I thought, and to me, to me, this was a, a similar thing. And the answer, of course, different people varied. Some said, "Well, it's keeping a tradition alive," which I think you could you could raise for classical music. We we are keeping this tradition of the human species alive by by saying well this is part of our history this is what some people have composed this is we continue to play this this is what we record it could it could touch you some people in the sword school said because i feel this need to serve something bigger like and for me that's the way of the warrior that's a thing that i that i like i i try to live um and maybe you could say something like that like well the classical music is part of my identity that's the type of music i like and this is what i want to keep alive so i suppose maybe there are multiple answers to that to to the question of why why yeah all right all right i i i don't have uh, too many experiences hearing from people who don't see a place for classical music mm -hmm. in in their life or who just who don't want it around or dislike it um, I, I remember one guy I met who was working in a bakery and I asked him, we were talking, I got on the classical music and he's like, oh, I don't like classical music. And I said, how come? And, and his response was, I find it too traditional. Right. And I can understand that feeling because yeah. one of my, one of my piano students likes a type of music that I don't like listening to it, not because of the music, but because it reminds me of things that I dislike. Uh, so yeah. I can understand a non-music related thing, but, but I don't have a lot of examples of uh, people who, who have talked to me saying, I don't really have a, uh, I, don't, I don't want it. I don't, I don't, I don't want this on. Um, you know, I've heard people saying with a little too much reverence, oh, I have great respect for it. You know, it's, it's really important. Um, and I don't know what's driving that. But uh, yeah, if you if anybody wants to comment, let us yeah. know why they don't have an interest in it or think it shouldn't be here. I'd like to know. Um, it's kind of interesting when I asked when I was in high school, there was kind of a general answer that everybody would give you when you asked them, "What kind of music do you like?" Pretty everybody said pretty much the same thing, pretty much anything except rap and country. Nice, <laughs> nice. The two the two musical styles that lean most heavily on 
Narrative storytelling. Yes. Yeah. What's going on there? Can you yeah. not follow a story? No, yeah. I'm not saying that I'm a big fan of either one of them, but I do like a good story. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. I don't know what's going on. That, that, that observation I made years ago, and I still think, well, what's going on there? Is it, yeah, but we could, we could maybe touch on that later. Nice. No, it's no Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, let's. We got to move on to the topic. Uh, the yeah, no, I, I, I will we, give you. We've, we've I'll give you classical one. music. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, we've, 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 I think we've, yeah, we've, we've milked that. I, 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 there's one thing I will say just because I want to relate this because it, this ties into to two people that you've you've mentioned before, and I just I just thought of. You, you will have no idea where this is going, but I promise you, this is going to a very clear apotheosis here. So at some point. <laughs> A long time ago, my first car, my first car was a gray Ford Escort. And this car, yeah, That's yeah, the listen. Car I've ever heard let's, about yeah, car. yeah, I, I, I won't, I won't comment. Here's, here's how this, <laughs> my, my granddad had that car and he had it for so long that all my childhood memories of driving with my grandparents was in that car. He bought a new car. Years, years later, he gave that car to my mother. My mother used it for a bit. I obtained my driver's license. She said, well, you have this car. You have this, You have fun with this car. Okay, now, because this was an older car, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in the Netherlands, every year it requires a checkup, right? It has to be at, like it's, otherwise you're not insured. So it goes to the checkup. And the guy from the shop calls us and says, um, yeah, this car is dead. Uh, this is done for. <laughs> This is not. No. This cannot be fixed. Like the, the, the important, basically, the, the the parts that keep this thing together are rusted through and through. The, <laughs> replacing this is buying a new car. So this car is dead. <laughs> so we, I never dealt with this. So the question was, what do you do? He said, you come to me. I give you a slip. That slip allows you to drive to a scrap heap. That's the only thing you can do. You drive it to a scrap heap. You can't drive it anywhere else. You can't take it for groceries. That's what uh, you do. And there they'll take care of you. So I said, okay. So my my mother says, okay, well, I'll drive you to the car shop. You drive in that car to the scrap heap. I'll follow you. And when we're there, I'll drive you back home. I said, sure. So, okay. So here's the point. Here's the, here's the point of the story. Here's the point of the story. Because now it turns into a movie. So sad as Barry Brown about his car, his first car <laughs> that has died, right? He is driving with this car, like somewhat like eyes watering, like, but this was my car, you know? And then I have the radio on and this radio, it's, it's tuned in to a station that only has classical music. Okay. Okay. So I want to say this was spring. I don't remember exactly, but here's how it turns into a movie. I'm sitting there half teary eyed driving to a scrappy. I have no idea where it is. It had rough instructions. So you got to figuring it out as you go and it starts to rain. So this is already like, it's like it starts, it turns into this movie, but then they start to play on this radio station a piece of music. And I think, well, that's interesting. That's interesting because it was the Marche Funèbre, the funeral march of March of Chopin, right? We all know this again, uh, any, any type of cartoon, the funeral march. So they start to play. And I think this is interesting because I have a recording from Rubinstein and it's a very nice recording, but this is a bit faster. It's, I don't want to say upbeat, because it's upbeat, but it's very played very interestingly. And I think, who is playing this? Who is who, Whose rendition is this? Because it sounded like an old recording. There was a little bit of a hiss in it. And then the guy, the, the sort of the announcer says, well, ladies, and they do it in, it's a classical music, so they do it in this voice, like, well, ladies and oh, gentlemen, yeah. you just listen to Chopin's Marche Funèbre, played by Sergei Rachmaninov. I was like, holy shit, that was Rachmaninov playing Chopin? I didn't even know there was a recording of that. There was. And I was blown away because it was perfect. There is the car that is dead. I'm driving in the rain. There is the funeral march, and not just the funeral march. It's played by Rachmaninov. So here's, here's the moral of this story, children. Sometimes classical music is worth it just because it hits you at exactly the right time. Well, you can make that argument for practically any event that happens in That's human true. existence. Yes. But, you know, Fair. I, I do want to, because we talked about that thing with the sati, you may notice Rachmaninoff takes that funeral march nice and quick. It, yes. It's a walkable funeral march. It's not a yes. bum, bum, ba, da, you know. Absolutely. And incidentally, 
at the very end, in the last like two bars, he drags mm-hmm. it down to the final tempo. He used someone else's diminuendos and expression marks. He used Ant Rubinstein's modifications to it. So he took the, he redistributed where the crescendos and decrescendos and the tempo changes were. And it just kind of it generates tension, but it just pushes the tension until the very end. It's not just sad yes. the whole time. He gives it yes. the direction. And you gotta get the recording of him playing the the it's not a scherzo, but that final thing at the fourth movement. That's that's impressive. He said that he wanted he wanted to try to copy what Ruben Anton Rubenstein was doing with that because whenever he heard him play that with the with the crescendos and the mm-hmm. pedaling, it sounded like wind over a grave. And it's just interesting. You don't even know what you heard. It's just you don't know what you hear for like a minute and a half. Suddenly it's over, and you're like, "What the hell was that?" And that's what you yes. want. And and Rachmaninoff worked hard on that. And that was. Like, you know, the, the producers at, at RCA were trying to argue, why does anybody want to hear you play the long stuff? Just play the short stuff. Just play the right. hits. Get right. it out there. Right. Sell that. Make that money. You know, but he, he wanted to. And, and that's one of the biggest mistakes ever, because I would have loved to hear Rachmaninoff record a Beethoven sonata or, yeah. you know, like I think he were, I think he was really good at the Chopin F minor fantasy, Opus 49. Mm-hmm. You know, the big long stuff, Rachmaninoff was really good at holding that musical line together and keeping you with, keeping it with you until the right moment to let it all out. And, and it's 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 too bad. Um, before I forget, so that is a hell of a story about your car. It's funny you should mention it. I wrote almost that exact same scene uh, in my novella, nice. which I, if you ever have a chance to read, I think 75, what, like 25,000 words? I got a little short story that you might get a kick nice. out of, and there's, nice. a, there's a good car scene in it, so you might appreciate good. that. So. Okay, uh, next up. <laughs> yes. Well, here's the, so on this happy note, <laughs> so, so weird. I'm sorry, but I just had to tell a story. Um, so, so here. Cool. It's an amazing story, and you it's, know it's, I, it's, it's different. And 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 like I think I nearly, I honestly like I nearly, I nearly when I heard that it was I nearly pulled the wheel. Like oh my god, he actually I did because I didn't I didn't actually know there were any recordings of him playing stuff. I did that was that was just a gap in my knowledge, but I didn't know that existed. I thought it was so fascinating. Anyway, oh, yeah. here's here's another thing that I brought up. Uh, I think yesterday or the day before, and I think that we need to. I I, I just want to address. So here's the thing. I read about, and I don't know how I read about it. I think it was some sort of recommended read for me. And I I, I wasn't sure whether to laugh or to cry, uh, as oh, we say. Oh, you're about to talk about what you're about. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we're talking yeah. about, because I think this is very interesting. So um, I, I try, I'll try. i try to introduce this as objectively as I can, but I, I may have an opinion about this. In a nutshell, there is a movement, I guess we could say, a, a trend. A trend, a thing. There are people uh, on social media who have taken to dress up and put on makeup to make them look. Holocaust survival ghosts. Exactly. You dress up like you were in a concentration camp, and then you talk about the experiences as if you were a ghost. Uh, who died from a, like a person who died in a concentration camp? This made me feel all sorts of things. So why don't we why don't we take this away, Pierre? What what do you uh, where do we start with this? Okay, what's my okay? So my quick assessment. I okay. So first thing. Oh, so everybody who's listening, I got e- Stephen's email. His email said. What did you say? I am increasingly uncertain about the world, or something. Yes, I I, I decreasingly understand the world. I think. Oh, it, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I thought, all right, what's this gonna be? Okay, link. All right, fine. Click. Oh, that's interesting. Then I got to see in some of the videos with the editing and the costumes and the little yellow stars yeah. and the little gaps of slit for some reason to let yeah. you know that you're impoverished, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah, you know, it goes with it. They're dirty, I guess, you know. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 got, I read that, and I think, okay, I think I know what's going on. Some people, you know, there's a thing that I've been learning uh, over the last 10, 15 years, talking to young people. I teach piano. I talk to a lot of young people. And I talk to a lot of parents about what they hear from young people. And there's a lot of things that you hear about. You hear about awkwardness. You hear about anxiety. A lot of people have anxiety, anxiety disorders sometimes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people feel awkward. And, a, and, there's, and, and like 
young person language has almost developed to deal with these kind of like we know that we're awkward and we know that we don't feel good at talking to communicating with one another so we start creating these conventions to make it as pal palatable as possible like yeah. Yeah. cutting punctuation or doing all of these things to sentences to make them feel less rigid less formal more free you know friendly you know and what i'm hearing is some people if if i'm right in guessing you feel awkward because Perhaps you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And if you're someone who is feeling awkward, I think perhaps you're someone who doesn't know what to do. And if you don't know what to do, there's, there's a good chance that you might not know how what you do is going to come across. You know you don't feel comfortable or confident in what you're doing, but you don't know much more than that. And I'd be guessing that a fair number of these people doing this are just there might be there might be some people who are just straight up attention hogs looking for some way of just getting them attention. But I bet some of them are thinking one of the things I read in there that was legitimate was some people or th they said it was legitimate was that some people want to raise awareness somehow, yeah. raise awareness. Yeah. And, you know, I'd say there's something wrong either not with them but something wrong is going on in our society if if somebody feels like they need to raise awareness about the holocaust yeah you know yeah. and and if you and if you're and if somehow if our society already failed you enough to where you think you need to do something like this then we've definitely failed you if we've communicated to you that that this is going to go across okay yeah and and i think these people are casualties of a broken society mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, it's, and it's because the only person who could check those people and say, wait a minute, this is a bad idea. This is unnecessary. You're not going to make the message that you think you're trying to make. Mm -hmm. This isn't the best way of putting out the of solving the problem that you think you're trying to solve. None of these are going to are working. Well. None of these are good ideas, irrespective of the disrespect and the the anti-Semitism, irrespective of all that stuff. This is just not going to go well. Those voices weren't there for those people. Mm -hmm. I don't think they heard them. So I'm guessing, I think this is, you know, it's these are kids who, you know, society failed them and they're kind of left them alone. They're kind of on their own devices to come up with their own crazy ways of language, their own you know, the way that they handle how they communicate through text and social media, you know, they're just left on their own scrambling, trying to figure out what, how to do, how to be people and yeah. stuff like this, I think is just going to keep happening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Casualties of a broken society is my assessment. There you go. Yeah. What do you think, Stephen? I think, well, yeah. Uh, I, I, how do you explain the, the existence of what we just saw? I, 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 I don't I, I, I genuinely don't know. I think your perspective is <clears throat> is a very compassionate one and is one that that I think it is true. I want to believe it is true, but I also think it is true that people who do this do not, especially given their age. These look like many of these were people in their what late teens or something or like I, oh, I would, oh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say maybe kids kids are younger than they than you think they are. So I'd say these are kids like, 11 to maybe 15 or yeah. something like that early yeah. younger yeah yeah i don't think any of those people had the idea of let's do something that really offends people i don't i don't believe that's what it was i don't believe that yeah. so then then what remains is then what are you trying to do indeed the argument of well i'm trying to raise awareness of this issue which i think is really bad and um which is like the whole Holocaust. We know this is denied by some people. They think that it never happened. Um, I, I, I understand the that approach that you in maybe youthful spirit might be misguided about seeing all ends of what you are doing and that you think that what you are doing is truly something that will raise 
awareness that will make people think, oh, oh that really happened. Oh, that's so, oh, and I did not know. I mean, that, that, something like that. I also think that's a very benign way of looking at it, but I, I don't I don't say that there is any malevolence truly intended with it. But having said that, I I, I don't even know. Again, I, I, I like I decreasingly understand the 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 thought processes. And I think that your reasoning of one of the saddest aspects of this is that there haven't been any people to talk to these kids and say, listen, this is a really, really bad idea. What you're about to do, I understand what you're trying to do, but this is really, really not what you want to be doing right now. Yeah. Uh, th th there was two things I wanted to interject with, if I may. Yeah, yeah, that of course. First, that, that first one, it's... As a guy who runs a pen-making business, <clears throat> I have a lot of ideas. And I work alone. There is no one here besides me telling me, Pierre, that's a terrible idea. Don't try to bring that to market. Don't do that. Right. Uh, I have a journal that I keep ideas in and I reread it and I try to get some wisdom out of taking bird's eye views of my own thought processes. Yeah. And that can work somewhat, but I know to do that. I have a journal. I look at things. I don't do anything hastily. And it doesn't always work, but it helps in as, as much as it can help. For these kids, there's just nobody in there to tell them this is a bad idea, you know. And or you know, nobody built the idea that there should be somebody, maybe a friend, maybe an adult, maybe your trusted person to say, "Hey, yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute." You know, you don't need an enabler. You need somebody to just tell you what they think you're hearing based on what you yeah. say, and it, and and it's giving it to you in plain English. And when you were saying seeing all ends, you know, the Gandalf quote, be careful, don't be too hasty to deal out death and judgment for even the wisest among us cannot see all ends. Yeah. So I, that just popped into my head when you were yes. saying they, they, they don't look through it. But, you know, you, 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 that happens sometimes when you you want to do something good, but there's no one there to tell you that this is going to blow up in your face. Yeah. Yeah. And for that, I also, I would not... I would not feel, I do not feel the need, I think, to pass judgments on these kids personally for well, what you are doing is utterly irresponsible. You should not have done that because I think you're right. I don't think they fully see that. It's not as if they chose to to club their friends to death and knew full well what they were doing. Like I, I don't think they 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 thought through oh, what was going like on. Oh, like in the Slenderman murders. Well, for example, yeah, like these yeah. kinds of things. Uh, but, but I mean, like like the, the, those, yeah, yeah, that's a whole different issue. Um, so I I don't think it's that. I definitely don't want to. I want to emphasize. <clears throat> I didn't want to bring this up to 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 ridicule these 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 kids doing that or making fun of this, but to more indeed have the discussion of how how does something like this happen, what does it mean, and what like what where, where like I, yeah, I I think that's mainly it. How does it happen? We, we adultify. We, we in America we adultify kids. We tell them on the one hand, you can't go here. You can't hang out too late. You can't do all this normal stuff that it sounds perfectly good to tell kids that they can and cannot do. But then at the same time, we say, but when you're in school, you got to take school shooter drills to take your own physical safety in the hands because adults can't fucking help you. Yes. And we say stuff like, oh, you know, if you see something, say something. But we also don't listen to you half the time when you tell us <laughs> stuff we don't want to hear. Yeah. You know, nice. We, nice. We, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. it, it, we do stuff to kids. We do stuff to kids all the time that realistically every one of those idiotic things that we do to kids is just one more way in which we lose their trust mm -hmm. and perhaps if you do that and often enough you lose the trust to the point where they just don't even come to you yeah and what you want with your kids is you want your kids to feel comfortable coming to you with stuff that they're not sure about or with stuff that they're excited about or stuff that mm -hmm. they're upset about you want them to come to you and if you've lost that uh well you can get stuff like this I would guess, so what about the people who are doing these videos who have supportive parents? Well, don't forget, 
We're also talking about parents of the generation, perhaps our age, maybe a little bit older, that are raising up these kids to end up with these anxiety complexes. Mm-hmm. And, that's the, and I don't think that's the kid's fault at all. I think we, uh, we and adults our age, maybe a little older, we're, we're raising, I don't know, we're, 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 doing, we're not raising them right. And somewhere along the lines, they, you know, this might be like, a kid could be in a perfectly loving household and think this idea up and have an encouraging parent right behind mm-hmm. it yeah. who's just not seeing things. It's just just doesn't occur to them. And yeah. I would say that's, um, yeah, that's an absence. That's growing up in the absence of good judgment. Not, I mean, and I don't expect kids to have good judgment. That's not fair to expect out of yeah. kid. Yeah. But adults have to have good judgment and be around. I, you know, it's. I think it's. This is what happens when you let <laughs> you let ten thousand monkeys with typewriters. That yeah, they give you Shakespeare after a while, but they also give you stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these Oops. kids are probably just doing the best of their can that they can. With the best, best of intentions, I, I do believe that with in their mind the best of intentions, but but the the outcome is uh, is is. Peculiar to say the least, <laughs> and disturbing. <laughs> like I mean, that's that's very generous. It's very generous. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody. I'm sure there's somebody over around there who's, you know, I, I guess I'm inclined to say that malevolence isn't really an issue because if you were malevolent and you were interested in being an anti-Semite, there are other places for you in which to do this. You yeah. could probably hang out on 4chan or one of those crazy dark yep. corners of the web where, yep. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you wouldn't be here doing this. Yeah, you could find other ways. So I, I'm, I'm inclined to say they're probably okay kids who, damn, I just wish I, I wish they had me as their piano teacher and told me what they were going to do, and I would have yes. told them, no, you know, don't do this. Here's, here's yeah. what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. But yeah. yeah, when you sent me that, you, uh, that was, that was something. That was, uh, thanks for that email. Yeah, no, I'm, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. I'm always ready to ruin someone's day with who we had shit. Always, always trying to help. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so what else? What else, Mr. Brown? Dr. Brown? Um, we had, um, <clears throat> I think we had <clears throat> a couple more interesting things. One thing you sent me was a bit of Chopin. We have kind of this has kind of been a music a music episode, so I think oh, we may as well <laughs> we may as well do the Chopin thing. That might be a nice conclusion to the whole thing. Yeah. Chopin, and, yeah. Opus forty eight, first movement. Um, uh, first first nocturne, Opus forty eight, number one. Sorry, yes, thank yeah. you. Um, and I thought it was I thought it was very fascinating, and I want to listen to it a couple more times to fully get. Fully get a more a more informed um, opinion on it, but I I think the the first the first comment on it I on YouTube I saw I thought was was very interesting. Someone said something along the lines of I think Chopin would have been a very interesting guy to cry with. And I thought that's that's a very interesting way to look at it. Like this is a very it it was a piece that evoked in me definitely emotion, emotional feelings. It starts off, at least I felt it to start off in a somewhat somewhat gentle fashion, and it kind of it sort of spirals it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger um and i i I really enjoyed it i really enjoyed it but it was especially the first the first part of it um i found very uh very melancholy like a very a very i found it a little i don't know i found it a little a little sad and then i thought yeah i can see the comment I think Chopin would be an interesting person to cry with. I I see it like this. It 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 has that sort of feeling of of bit of sadness, bit of bit of 
maybe disillusion the state of the world or something and and then and then that so i i i found it very interesting as i said i have to listen to it a couple more times to fully absorb this uh some of the best videos that i've seen if, you, if you'd like a video are yeah valentina igoshina i-g-o-s-h-i-n-a mm -hmm. uh, she did a video of it that i think must have come out it's probably 10 years old by now uh valentina igoshina and you know, Valentina Lasitza, of course, because she's uh, she's got a, a recording of pretty much everything. Um, off the top of my head, I I the thing is, and, and this is feel free to bring on the hate. I know it's out there, but uh, I feel like this is one of those pieces that to really get what's to really get the feeling what's so phenomenal about this composition, you really have to play it yourself. Yeah, I can see and, that. And I've never heard a recording that I really liked. I love it when I play it. Mm -hmm. I think I do a good version of it. And I think everybody that I've heard does not do to it what I think should be done with it. So I think, you know, if we ever got together live and I could play for you, I'd play it for you my way. I think that, you know, I think I would do a good job. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug for Pierre Miller pianist. PierreMiller.com. So... I think, yeah, it's 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 really impressive piece, but uh, the to me the the real the real thing is that it's just it just starts slow and soft and just keeps building and it builds, I think, from just the composition it builds to an untenable level. Um, there is, it is it is nearly impossible to play through that piece, and give it everything that you want to give it emotionally and physically without completely destroying the piece mm -hmm. because the way that it's structured in the registers of the piano, you'll just overwhelm the melody that you overwhelm the part that you want to hear with all the stuff that you have to do. And it takes, I would say a lot of self-control to get through that piece. And I've never heard anybody do it. I've never heard a recording where anybody could get all the way through that piece and not just, you know, just go out of control with it. I have heard people who maintain control all the way through. Arthur Rubenstein's really good. I think Van Cliburn had a recording of it. I, I, I think, and you know, and I've heard really, you know, it's nice when you it's it's nice when you can hear that way, but they always sound held back. And to sound like you're really losing control while maintaining enough control to be able to follow it is it's, it's like the task of a lifetime. And, uh, you know, to me, that's what really, that's the thing about that piece that just, that I find so fascinating. And the fact that it's the biggest, loudest, longest nocturne is, is also, and the hardest, that's also kind of nice too. But, but that, that, that duality of, you know, lose control, but don't, Sound like you're losing control, but don't lose control. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, you know. I'd like to hear a Vulcan play it. <laughs> oh, you haven't, you haven't been watching Star Trek. So no, but I understand what you mean. I understand what you mean. I, it, it's, I think sometimes this is, uh, this is a true challenge in, in specific pieces of music. I think, for example, of um, uh, the Casta Diva, Aria <clears throat> from I want to say Norma by Bellini. Well, I could be wrong, but Casta Diva, complicated, very complicated area to sing because it pretty much turns into almost like con controlled shouting. Like it's it's a very it's a very intense area. Not not like like Wagner and like that stuff, but 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 control control requires a lot, asks a lot of someone's voice. So I understand what you mean. Very difficult, I would imagine, not being a musician, but very difficult, I would imagine, to to obtain that, to have the the uncontrolled control or the controlled uncontrolled. I don't know which of the two it is, but like to 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 maintain that. And I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. I will link, I will link, I'll put a description to that to that like a link to the, 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 the this piece in the description because I think people have to listen to it to to understand what you mean. But but I hear it. Yeah, it, it builds up. And it keeps building up. Like I, I, I often find, like you, you have these pieces of music. They, 
they build up to something and then that's it and then it levels off again but this just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and it and it doesn't it, it it doesn't let let up at some exactly. point which is which yeah. is fascinating there's not really a, a good time for you to take a break as a performer you have yes. to be full and strong before you start and i guess your break is right at the beginning you get two minutes yeah. of take it easy uh you know it's i i play i've been playing that piece since college and but so man it's it's great too because at the beginning of it the harmonies aren't completely filled out. So you don't, so you hear isolated notes in the melody and a little bit of bass and a little chord here, but it's not, you know, the richness isn't there. And so at the end, <clears throat> he fills it out and you can hear more clearly what the harmony is supposed to be. And in one of those moments, there is one chord in particular where if you, it's like, this is the chord where people start crying. Mm -hmm. I knew it when I played it the first time and every single person I played it for one-on-one -on -one are like, oh my goodness, that was the moment. That was the moment. And 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 it's so great. It's nowhere near done when that moment comes by. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You know, for yeah, so supposedly Chopin was like five foot five foot nothing and never mm -hmm. more than a hundred pounds. And I can only imagine what it must be like to be, to be someone who wrote a piece that's so demanding with minimal physical resources, yeah. you know, because he's, he's not he, you know, like people say he never really got past the mezzo forte mm -hmm. and, you know, because he was too weak, too, too, too small. And, and it yeah. was, it's, I, I just wonder what, what has, it's gotta be something else to write a piece that you can't live up to. Uh, Cause I, I do not see him, holding that together because because i can i can hear him doing it well because he would shade it and he wouldn't let it overwhelm it but but it, but it, it couldn't just explode the way that it sounds like it wants to uh especially not towards the end uh that's man oh man that, that's a great piece you know Oh man, I, I I gotta go have a look at that when we get done with this. That's such a good piece. I, I like no, I love I love this image. I didn't I didn't know that. I understand what you mean about the statue. The, the the problem is that now now what I have I have this mental image of Arnold Schwarzenegger playing the piano and going yeah all the time. And this is a really disturbing image of him in his tuxedo doing this with all his power just going there and jamming away at this. I'm sorry, I have a visual mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is the piece this is the piece for that sort of thing and you know man i i i break I, i've seen people break strings it's not that it's not it, it's it's impressive because it always it's sudden and you hear it but right. it's never uh you know it's it's not as interesting as just carrying on through and just blowing us away with it and yeah but yeah that, that that's a it's you gotta you really have to play that piece to know to know that feeling because in life real lived experience moments where you have to be in control but almost get make it seem like you're giving yourself away to control giving away control they don't come by that often thank god yeah 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 <sighs> yeah so yeah so thanks yeah. for listening to it i'm, I'm glad no. uh, you know one of these days i gotta maybe do an instagram live stream or something i'll play that piece and you know That'd be awesome. hear what we're talking about but honestly yeah. it wouldn't even come through well because of the recording quality when you that's the arrows are hard to mic and it's yeah. the hardest instrument to microphone and you got to be able to you, uh, you know I, mean, I need your ears to be hurting if i do this yeah. right and, yeah. and it won't come through but but yeah maybe one day in person one of these very days. interesting yeah, yeah very interesting well i think we're up to an hour 52 minutes oh so boy. I think this may be a natural moment. This was a very sort of climactic ending. I've got the feeling that we were like building up to and it's just exploding. So this, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll make sure to link to the, to that, to the recording you sent me too. Um, sure. Yeah, no, this was fun. I had a really good time. This was a very interesting broad range of topics. I enjoyed the music, the musical conversation. So sure. people, if you have any questions for us, let us know. We'll be happy to look into it. Um, let us know what you think. And subscribe to the Desert Rider Pen Company. Oh yes, do describe. Sorry, describe. No, we have already described it. Do subscribe to the political views of the Desert. No, sorry. Uh, do do subscribe to the the Desiderata Pens YouTube channel, please, because it really helps out Pierre. Uh, yeah, I will link to that as well. And uh, and that's pretty much it. We shall be back soon for more conversation. Yeah.
about mm -hmm. dying cars and exploding teenagers. What was it? No, exploding mm -hmm. music and weird teenagers and all kinds of stuff. We'll be there. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Goodbye.